What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I hope that you brought yourself a cup of coffee. I brought myself one. It's good coffee. It's Trader Joe's. It's whole bean. Just ground it and then I made a pot. Today's gonna be story time. I wanna talk about how I buy gear for my studio. And I want, wanna walk through some of the, the best practices that I use, some of the ways that I go about looking for gear and talking about that. But I also want to tell you the story of how I found the best microphone in my collection and my favorite microphone. I use it on basically every record that I've, that I've made for the last almost two years. I have used this one particular microphone. And so I'm going to tell you the story of how I found that microphone. I'm going to use that as a little bit of a case study for how I find the gear that I use here at Gem City Studios. So let's not waste any time. Let's just get right down to it. This is a fantastic microphone. It's in this little bag. It's a Crown Royal bag. You should put all your mics that are expensive and vintage and collectible and wonderful in Crown Royal bags. Just looked at the monitor that's going to be disorienting for some of you. This is a 1945. Let's see if I can get the light to hit it just right. There we go. It's a 1945 RCA 44. And I've had it refurbished. It was refurbished by Clarence Kane at ENAC Mic Repair. And, uh, Man, I just love this microphone. It is, um, it's old, it's vintage. It sounds really cool. I've used it for vintage vibey sounding vocals on like some alt country type recordings. I have used it for videos, I've used it in music videos, had, had, a, had a music video that uh, was filmed here at the studio and we used it sort of as a prop. So that was cool. I, um, I use it a lot on drums it lives sort of on this big starboard vintage starboard stand that i assume that the original owner bought with the microphone and probably used in their studio it lives on that it stays on that here at the studio so that we could just roll this microphone around and use it whenever we want and that's why it's in the crown royal bag is because i want to keep dust off of it when it's not being used and rather than dismounting it all the time from the large rolling heavy based starboard stand that it has to be on because this thing weighs i mean that's a good I should have weighed it for the video, but it's a good 15 pounds. And I'm just gonna set it down over here on the shelf. I should set it on that. Man, rookie move. Got lazy because I'm on camera and didn't want to do it. But you know what? I'm, this is like sort of an uncut. This is like a more low key, unproduced kind of a video. I wanted it to be just kind of a conversation, I guess, about, about gear. We're drinking coffee. We're having a good time together, right? So, Let's talk about how I found this microphone. It's been almost, not quite two years ago, in December, I got a phone call from a friend. He said, hey Matt, I was at this lady's house. Her husband had passed away several years ago and she's decided now to sell the house. They had a home studio. It's about two hours away from you. Here's where it is. And she's selling off everything that was his in his home studio you should go over and you should look at it. You should go see what's there. There's gonna be some stuff that you're gonna want, you know? And he's telling me about like outboard gear, reel to reel. I'm calling up my friends and I'm like dreaming. I'm in total dream mode. Like what if there's an 1176? What if there's an old Fairchild? Like, you know, I, you just don't know with some of this old stuff. You know, he talked about reel to reel tape machines. And so, you know, but of course also knowing that it was kind of a, a home studio, it wasn't a commercial space. He wasn't making records that were being released. It was just more so he could record with his friends and demo ideas and things like that, that, you know, I wasn't expecting a whole lot. So I get the number of the lady that had the equipment and I call her and I say, Hey, my friend Tim said, come and check out this place. Check out the, check out the, the gear. You've got it for sale and maybe some guitars too. I'd love to come over and look and see if there's anything I'd be interested in buying. She says, yeah, come on over, come check out the stuff. And so the next day I pick up my friend Dustin, we roll over, get there about 11 in the morning, something like that. She invites us in, we go downstairs and it's, it's this wonderful, man, I wish I had at the time gotten like B-roll so that I could custom this in because this is a wonderful like billiard room slash home studio slash bar, all this, you know, 
awesome ornate wood and these big columns. It was just a beautiful house. The house was like 8,000 square feet. And I bet this basement room was almost as big as our, our live room here, which is about 1,500, 1,600 square feet. And uh, like I said, there was, there was gun cabinets and a bar and just all this stuff. So we're walking through and she had a lot of it just laid out. And I was immediately disappointed because the first things that I saw was these old PV microphones and SM58s and some stuff that was even, you know, I, I hadn't ever heard of before that was just like cheap, you know, I don't know, like I, I can't even remember the name brands, but it was all stuff that I knew was recognizably cheap with the exception of a couple of SM58s. And then there were a couple of big PV speakers on stands and like a rehearsal system from like the late seventies, early eighties kind of stuff. And, uh, there weren't any racks of gear. There weren't any reel-to-reel -reel tape machines. There was nothing. And then she was like, you know, feel free to look around. There's some stuff in the closets. And I immediately got excited because I opened the closet door and that's where I found the large Starbird stand that was in the closet. And I was like, okay, you wouldn't have this stand unless if you had some serious microphones. And then I found a clip to a Neumann U87. So I immediately started looking for, looking around for a U87 somewhere, but I couldn't find any boxes, nothing. It was just the outside support of the U87. And uh, it didn't have the shock mount or the, 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 the rubber bands for the shock mount or the inside piece that attaches to the microphone. None of that, it's just that outside piece. <laughs> I was getting really frustrated because at this point, all I found is a stand, which is worth, you know, kind of some money. These Starbird stands even used still sell for you know probably around 300 bucks or something like that um they're really nice stands but uh there were no u87s and i looked high and low looked in every closet every box that she said i was allowed to go through uh at that time you know and i couldn't find it so i was really disappointed and was thinking like man cause tim has sent me my friend tim has sent me on a wild goose chase there's like nothing over here that i would want to buy there was one little like yamaha sound system soundboard mixing board not like this i mean it was from probably this is from the 70s the console that they had was probably from the i don't know the early 80s late 80s something like that so it's much smaller you know more in line with like some of the more affordable mackie consoles that you would see definitely nothing special it was 16 channels and nothing cool at all no no transformers no direct outs nothing like that so you know, I'm thinking, well, this was a total waste of time. And she says to me, hey, there's something that I want you to see in this box. I totally forgot about this microphone. And so I'm thinking, gosh, here it is. Here is the U87 that she's found it. You know, it was like in some other storage closet with a bunch of computer stuff. She pulls it out, she brings it over to me, and it's in this old box that says NBC radio on it. And I open it up and it's this RCA 44. <laughs> And it was completely the metal, this part right here, um, let's see if I can get that to focus. The metal of the grill was completely just rusted over. Uh, there was foam from the box that had fallen into the grill. It was completely, you couldn't see the ribbon. You might not be able to see the ribbon on camera. You can kind of see through there with the light, but you couldn't see through to that or anything. Uh, the paint was off of the logo. Um, all this metal was pitted and rusted up. And, but I knew what it was and I picked it up out of the box and my hands were like physically like shaking because I knew exactly what this microphone was. I didn't know the exact year yet, but I knew that it was a good one and I knew that it was worth having. And so we walked upstairs and um, I started to try to make an offer and I wanted to buy just the microphone because that was the only thing that was there. But then she said, listen, I'll sell you I'll sell you everything that's down there, but you got to buy it all and I'll, I'll make it worth your while. And I thought, okay, what's that mean exactly? And so I said, well, how much are you thinking? And she said, well, I'd like to start a thousand bucks. And I was thinking to myself, Hmm, I know that the microphone is worth that, but I also know that I don't have that much cash on me. Uh, Actually, I didn't have any cash on me because I didn't know if I was buying anything. I know I was going to have to run to an ATM, and I knew that maybe the most I could get out was probably $600. And so I told her, okay, uh, $1,000. I said, you know, um, that old mic, I was just honest with her. I said, that old mic is definitely worth what you're asking, 
probably a little more if it was in working condition and if I could actually test it, but I can't test it over here and I don't know what condition the ribbon's in, if it's even gonna come on. And you know, it needs, it needs a bunch of work and that's gonna cost me a significant amount of money. And so I went out and I made a phone call to Clarence Kane at ENAC Microphones and I said, hey, this is Matt McQueen. I don't know if you know, remember me, but I've had a, I had a 74 Junior, which is another RCA microphone. I'd had it repaired by him before and I said I've got a I'm looking at a RCA 44 and I think it's pretty old probably from the 40s uh, how much is that gonna cost me to get that repaired if I send it to you and so he said well it's probably gonna be roughly about $350 you know just just guessing and then plus shipping or whatever to get the ribbon and all the you know depending on what all you want done to it as far as refurbished and things like that so I had that information and that's the first point that I want to say about buying used gear if you're going to buy something used, you absolutely need to know what you're getting into as far as the price and how much you're going to spend on it and how much it's going to cost you if there's any repair cost associated with that. Because, you know, if you end up spending a, a bunch of money, if I if I spent a thousand dollars on this microphone and then spent three or four hundred dollars to get it to get it repaired, you know, then I'm still saving money, but I'm not saving as much money necessarily as maybe I would have been you know, for it to, to happen the way that it happened, you know? And again, these microphones in, in this condition, I could probably sell this on reverb right now, low side, 2,500, high side, maybe three grand. So it's definitely, it's definitely worth way more than what I ended up paying for it. But you know, it's always good to be sure. If you're gonna buy it, you definitely want to be sure and you wanna know. And so if you don't know, you, you, you've you got to know who the experts are. And the only reason that I knew who Clarence Kane was is because I'd had a microphone repaired by him in the past and I'd done the research. So that's probably thing number two, you know, if you don't know, do the research. Google is super helpful. There's a ton of articles on reverb. Find out what it is that you're buying. Find out information about it so that you know what you're getting into. So I walk back in the house at this point, now that I've got the information that I needed and I know you know, how the offering can go. But then I'm still thinking to myself, gosh, she wants me to buy all this other junk. And what am I going to do with all that? You know, it's like four PV speakers that I didn't know if any of those worked. This old mixing console, all these SM58s, which the SM58s, I mean, those are pretty bulletproof. You can kind of count on those working. So I ended up saying, well, I don't have any cash on me and I can for sure go to the ATM and maybe get 500 bucks. And she said, uh, that's not enough. And so she invites her brother into the room and she says, hey, I'm, a, I'm telling Matt, you know, $1,000 for all the stuff. He wants the microphone for sure, but I'm telling him a thousand bucks. He's saying $500, you know, what should I sell it to him for? And her brother just says, ah, we need to get it out of the house. Just, I don't know, 750. Ah, hell, just give it to him for $600. So she says, okay, $600. And I went, all right, I'll be right back. I'm going to the ATM. Well, we had to drive 15 miles up the road to get to the nearest town. I mean, this was on a mountain in Tennessee. So we had to drive 15 miles, go to an ATM, go through this whole thing of getting the money. And we actually had to stop at like three places because the ATM at the first little gas station, it ran out after I took out a hundred bucks. And then I had to go to a bank and get like a cash advance thing with my Visa card. And they gave me some money. We drive back. And then it took probably, I mean, when I say there was a bunch of stuff, there was a bunch of stuff that she ended up getting to us. Uh, I got this old drum machine, my friend Nate Washburn, he has that, I gave him that. This old Yamaha 16 channel mixer, all these things. And I brought that back. And of course I have to figure that into my cost as well, because that's all time. Yeah, I made some money back on that stuff, but that was all stuff that I had to, to sell off. And, um, Anyways, it did all end up paying off for me because with the cost of the microphone repair, plus what I spent, the 600 bucks that day, plus the fuel to get over there, uh, paying for lunch for me and for Dustin and my son that went with us, it ended up being, I had about $1,000 all in. So I ended up selling off all the stuff and I do have, you know, I, I mean, that's a great deal on this mic. It's super rare to get one for this much. I'm almost embarrassed to say that I ended up I have about $250 after selling everything on reverb in the microphone, which is insanely, insanely ridiculous. You would never just find somebody selling one of these for $250, but it is the coolest microphone. And I think the point, the lesson, if this is like a case study for how to buy, to buy gear, and definitely I understand it's like an extreme, extreme situation. Like you usually aren't going to find this, but 
because I went in knowing about the microphone, because I went in knowing what it was worth, how much it was gonna cost me to fix it, and because I knew how much all that other stuff was worth and that I might be able to make out on it, I ended up getting a really, really great deal. I mean, probably a lot of you are gonna say in the comments, a steal, <laughs> stole this mic from this, this old lady, but she was actually super happy to give it to me because she ended up talking about how, you know, Listen, I know I'm selling this microphone to you for a lot cheaper than probably what I could get out of it. But she told me, you know, she, she, I shared with her pictures of the studio, showed her stuff that I was working on, and she told me, standing on her porch, I feel like you're the right person to sell this to because I know that you're gonna take it, you're gonna love it, you're gonna use it. And she said, that just makes me feel good because that's what my husband would have wanted. He would have wanted somebody that was gonna take this microphone and put it to use. And, you know, I promised her that I was going to use it, that I wasn't going to flip it. I wasn't going to just make a quick buck and get three grand out of the microphone. And so, you know, she knew basically through that conversation what it was worth and what she was selling it to me for uh, was a lot cheaper than the value. And so she made me a great deal on the microphone. If you take this and you apply it to other things, though, I've gotten a lot of deals this way where I end up buying a couple of things, three or four things, or something that's more than what I needed. And so I'm gonna give you one more example, a lot more quickly though, this Friedman BE100. Curtis and I've talked about this before. The guy ended up posting this on Facebook Marketplace in Cincinnati, Ohio, so it was a pretty far drive away. He posted it with two cabinets. He was wanting $2,900 for it. I offered him 25 for the whole rig, so the head, plus the two cabinets, and I ended up selling the two cabinets for $600 a piece uh, locally. And so to end up with a BE100 for basically $1,300, that's a super good deal. Like the cheapest you'll find on Reverb is probably $2,200 for a used one. And again, the only reason that I was able to pull that off and make that work is because I knew what the cabs were worth before I went into it and from just doing research and I knew what the head was worth because I had been looking for a BE for probably two months before I bought it, which brings me to point number three. The minute that you want to buy something for your studio is usually not the best time to buy something. Like you're not gonna find the deal that you're looking for if you decide on Tuesday, I'm gonna buy this for my studio. And then on Wednesday, you've purchased it. Almost always, you're not gonna find the deal that you're looking for. And you can save yourself a lot of money. I just keep a running list of things that I'm looking for. There's a bunch of stuff that I know that I'm looking for. And if I find the right deal on it, that that is the point at which I'll buy it. So, you know, with the microphone, obviously I'm always looking for nice vintage microphones because of the way that I make records and the sounds that I'm looking for, I'm not really into all the new stuff of getting the, you know, a slate microphone with all the models and stuff. And I had one of those, they sound cool, but that's just the more that I've, the more that I've done this, I know the sounds that I'm looking for and I want to find the, you know, the old stuff and the things that they made records with the classic records that I love listening to and, and go after those sounds. It's just, that's just my preference. That doesn't mean that the new way is right or wrong. It's just what I do. And so, you know, I'm sort of rambling here, but the point is, is that you really need to be able to know what it is that you want to buy and then be patient and wait and find the deals. Let them come to you. And I think that that's one great way that you can save money for yourself and for your studio. So guys, I hope this was helpful. This was more of just a, a fun video because I've got some free time this afternoon and I wanted to talk about it. I love this RCA microphone. It's been a massive blessing to have this and I hope to have it for years to come. I hope you enjoyed this story and your cup of coffee. Leave me a comment. I wanna know what the best deal is that you've ever gotten for your studio. So if you've got a story, tell me in the comments below and uh, I'll see you next time.